All right, welcome back to Miniature Game Montage and another What I've Learned video, this time with another focus on Necromunda and House Goliath. I'll try to remember to leave timestamps in the description below so you can reference those. I do like to break this up into topics. Just really keep in mind that this is coming from the eyes of a casual player and what I've learned over playing House Goliath over the last few years. I am not a competitive player, I don't min-max, and there's probably better ways to do things. The purpose of this video is to maybe help guide you with some tips and tricks, show you maybe what to do or potentially what not to do. So let's dive right in, and first topic will be playstyle. So House Goliath is what I consider to be a mid, short, and certainly close combat type of gang. And the reason that I say mid-range is because their house favorite gun or range weapon is a stub cannon. It does have an 18-inch range, but unfortunately there is no benefit to short range, and most of the time you're going to be hitting on fours. You may like House Goliath if you like to have that increased strength and toughness, uh, getting into combat, bashing faces, or if you just like the number four, House Goliath could be a gang for you. One of their house specialties is gene smithing, which we will cover in a topic to itself. And gene smithing allows you to pick certain types of fighters, vat born, natural born, even unborn, and give them certain characteristics modifications. Some of these can be positive and some of these can be negative. The next topic is gang founding. And as I mentioned in our previous video, the what I've learned for House Escher, if you have a bad gang founding, it can be a very tough hole to dig out of. We're gonna cover gang foundings and it can be a little more difficult for House Goliath as their fighters tend to be pretty expensive. We'll start with your leader or the Forge Tyrant and he has a movement of four and just about all of your Goliaths are gonna have that shorter movement range of four inches versus a normal of five, but he moves four. He has a weapon skill and a ballistic skill of three, so slightly improved from normal fighters. He does have a strength and toughness of four, which is outstanding, and three attacks, which is very good. He is also a multi-wound fighter, and he has a four-up cool, so he is he stays on the board. I like to equip him with a melee weapon of some type, as well as a pistol. You can run him in various different ways. We tend to use a power hammer on ours, because that is the way that the boxes are uh, modeled with, out of the box. And that power hammer can be good, but it's also pretty expensive. Power, of course, is when you roll to hit. If you get any sixes, you essentially ignore saves, and it also increases the damage by one. If you want to keep something in that power family, you could go 10 credits down and consider a power axe. The power axe is strength plus two, so on his four, that takes you to a six. Most of the time on your hits, you will be wounding on twos if your target is a toughness of three because you double that with the strength. It is only one damage, but it is AP minus two, which will cut through most of your opponent's armor. Even cheaper, you could consider a chain axe. It's really up to you. You just want to be sure that you really take advantage of his three attacks because you get plus one for the charge and plus one for dual melee weapons or a sidearm, which means five attacks in total with a weapon skill of three, you're going to get a pretty good few of those that go through and then needing twos to wound in a lot of cases. That's pretty good. You're going to bring a lot of opponents down with those statistics. For the other sidearm, we run him with a plasma pistol as again, that is the way that he is modeled out of the box. You could choose from a variety of different pistols, but plasma and Necromunda really just does work. It essentially gives you a lot of options as you close the range to get other fighters into close combat, you can still take them out of action within 12 inches with a plasma pistol. Now, as I mentioned earlier, gene smithing will be a topic to itself, and we will specifically talk about gene smithing for Forged Tyrants. But for right now, let's move on to our champions. And there's two different types. There is the Forge Boss, which is kind of your normal champion, and then there's the Stemmer. And similar to the Death Maidens for Escher, I really, really like Stemmers. While they only move four inches, they still have that strength toughness of four, but they have a weapon skill of two and a ballistic skill of four. Once again, they have three attacks, which can go to many more with their combat chems that they carry. You can roll a d6 and modify that attack characteristic, but the base is three. And just starting with that base, I really like to pair these guys up with paired pulverizers. 
And the reason being is because the pair special rule doubles your base attack, so that goes from three to six on the charge. And then you get plus one for the charge and plus one for two melee weapons, taking that to eight. And the pair pulverizers, you're hitting on twos and you're gonna be wounding on threes most of the time if you're fighting a toughness three fighter. And while it only does one damage, it does have the pulverize rule, so you roll a d6. If it's equal to or higher than your opponent's toughness, you can change an injury die from a flesh wound to a serious injury, allowing you to get a coup de grace. Those pulverizers are AP minus one as well, so even if your opponent's wearing mesh armor and has a five up save, you're pushing that back to sixes, and if they have anything less than that, then there is no save. Those are really good on the stemmers. There are some equipment that you can give to them to give them that additional movement, which is stem slugs that can take their movement from four to six and even allow them to wound on twos in most cases, but we will cover that later on in the equipment piece. If you take a stemmer with the paired pulverizers and furnace plates, which gives you a six up save all around and five up in the front, that's kind of the normal for House Goliath or the furnace plates for five credits. The stemmer is 180 credits and that is just a really good deal. Now for your normal champions, or the forge bosses as they are called, they still have a movement of four. They have a weapon skill of three, ballistic skill of four. There are two wounds and they have two attacks. So slightly less than what the stemmer or your leader would get. They are cool on a five up, which is still really good. And for your normal champions, it really depends on how you want to run these guys. Do you want them to be more close combat oriented or do you want them to be more range or anything in between? The choices are really up to you. Out of the box, these guys come with a rivet cannon according to the back of the box, or you can get the renderizer, the serrated axe, which is a two-handed weapon. And I've used both of these. I will say that setting people on fire with a rivet cannon can be a lot of fun. And we've had in one of our campaigns where somebody was set ablaze and you know they ran off a gantry and, and fell. Stuff like that is really cool. I like either of those options for narrative play. The renderizer serrated axe gives you plus two to your strength. So normally you're gonna be strength six. That means you're gonna be wounding on twos. It will cut through a lot of the armor that your opponents are gonna wear. And it also has the pulverize rule, which we talked about earlier, allowing you to roll a D6 and change uh, a flesh wound to a serious injury. So that would be a viable option if you want to maintain him close combat. And there's a lot of other options as well. You could consider a grenade launcher if you wanted to. You just have to keep in mind that you're hitting on fours. And the thing about grenade launchers is you don't have to target a fighter if you're firing them in the frag mode because you can target a piece of terrain, you can target the floor in front of them. You can avoid checks, willpower checks for masks that the corpse grinders may wear. So a grenade launcher could be an option too if you want to go that route. You just have to keep in mind that you're hitting on fours as a base with these guys. Now, for your normal gangers, or bruisers, as House Goliath likes to call them, it really is up to you, once again, on how you want to run these guys. The kind of house range weapon is a stub cannon. While it does, again, go 18 inches, you are hitting on a base of four. They have a movement four, uh, ballistic skill, weapon skill of four, strength toughness of four, uh, leadership is five, so they do stay cool under pressure. But the stub cannon, it's not that good. It is strength five, so it does wound on threes. It just doesn't seem to hit a whole lot when it's fours, and then you have to factor in modifiers. Uh, if your opponent is in full cover, for example, you're going to need a six to hit. So it can be difficult. On the opposite side, you could run with melee weapons, and they have a lot of options here. Axes and spud jackers tend to be the most common as far as the modeling is concerned. The issue is that they're only one damage each, there's no AP on the weapons, and these guys only get one attack. So you want to pair those either together uh, with a pistol or a sidearm, so they get you know three attacks on the charge, you know, plus one for having dual melee weapons and or a sidearm. Also, don't forget that one of these gangers, when founding a gang, can become specialist. So if you want to try to squeeze out a grenade launcher on one of these guys, it could be a better option than equipping that on your champion and giving that to a specialist to your gang at founding. All right, and next we'll move on to Jews, or as House Goliath calls them, bullies. There's also Forgeborn, which are your prospects. That's kind of your specialist Jews. 
The big difference between the Forgeborn and the Jubes is the Forgeborn have a 5 inch move where the Bullies only have a 4 inch move. The Forgeborn are also only strength 3 where your Bullies are going to be your normal strength 4. Both will have a weapon skill of 4, so better close combat than they are ballistic skill as their ballistic skill is actually a 5 and they are just one wound and one attack. Your cool checks are going to be worse as well as they are sevens. So you want to definitely keep them within 12 inches of your leader or, you know, for the prospects it really doesn't matter too much because when they go down, nearby fighters uh, close to them do not have to take uh, nerf checks. Now, speaking of Forgeborn, these guys are cheap. They have a movement of five, again, and they can move around the board a lot faster than your other gang members. These guys are objective getters. They are fodder. When they go down again, they don't have to take, they don't force other ones around them to take nerf checks. They can be very cheap if you equip them with a fighting knife just to give them something and some furnace plates for defense. But uh, if you look to equip them with any of their specialist type of weapons, like the heavy rock saw, can get very expensive and while that rock saw is strength plus three so it takes you to a six under normal circumstances you'll be wounding on twos it is about 120 credits so that very cheap forgeborn just got very expensive alternatively they can take this storm arc welder that is reckless so it can uh, hurt other your own gang members in the area it has a range up to 18 inches and i think that is around 70 or so credits if i'm not mistaken I would consider your bullies uh, similar to the Forgeborn. They are a little slower, however. You can give them some different weapons, though, and they have a weapon skill of four. So if they do get into combat, they would be like a normal ganger for those purposes. They could potentially take someone out of action just to due to their increased strength. So in summary, the House of Chains can be a lot of fun for getting into close combat and really using a lot of the things that they have, such as gene smithing and tactics. Their tactics cards are really good and the different skills they have really lend to their play style. So they can really be a lot of fun. You just have to be careful when founding a gang as the more that you do with certain characters, it certainly increases their credits cost and it can add up very quickly and you want to really be sure that you have enough bodies on the board when you're founding a game. All right, the next topic that we're going to look at are skills. And when you're looking at skills, your primary skills for House Goliath are going to be Brawn, Ferocity, and Leadership. The Stemmer will actually switch in Muscle instead of Leadership. And there's a few skills that really stick out to me, and I'm going to point those out. Bulging Biceps can undo Unwieldy, which can certainly serve purposes if you plan on running with some of those two-handed weapons on your Leadership. Pearl is a very thematic skill, probably not something I would take, but thematically it makes it just makes sense. I mean, to hurl someone off a catwalk is a perfect example. You can also take Berserker, which on the charge gives you one additional attack. That can be very good as well. Fearsome can protect you from getting charged by making the opponent have to take a willpower check. That is very similar to how the Corpse Grinder Gangers are. But one that really sticks out to me is Nerves of Steel. And Nerves of Steel just means that if you pass a cool check after you've been hit, if you pass that cool check, which normally is going to be a four, then you can avoid getting pinned and return to standing. And when you're trying to close the gap on an opponent, that is an excellent, excellent skill to have. I think Unstoppable and True Grit are worth honorable mentions. Over on the leadership side, Overseer, again, is good. It is a bit situational, though, because people need to be within six inches of you for that to happen. For muscle on your stemmers, Iron Man allows you to make flesh wounds pretty much irrelevant to your toughness. In other words, they do not lower your toughness. And then also Walk It Off allows you to discard flesh wounds. That is a pretty big one as well. Really, one of the most important things with House Goliath and when you're trying to get into close combat is you want to be sure that you keep them off their back. That's why Nerves of Steel really makes a lot of sense here, especially with their very good cool checks. They can easily pass those and avoid getting pinned, allowing them to get into combat. All right, let's talk gene smithing, which is often a debated topic and one that does need to be arbitrated at times. A lot of groups will have their own rules uh, regarding gene smithing as there's a lot of combinations that can really make it difficult for your opponents. Your fighters normally come VAT born and they can pick from those skills and pay the credits to get them. Uh, if you want to pay 20 credits more, however, they can be naturally born, which opens up a new gene smithing set, 
or they can be unborn for 10 credits. Your leaders and champions can have two, and the rest of your members can have one modification. If you decide to just keep your members as they are, Dermal Hardening seems to be a go-to as it increases your toughness by one. There are some modifications that can actually give you credits back, such as worsening your cool by one. If you're playing against a lot of gas and toxin weapons, then Hardened Immune System is also one to look at if you are that born. And what that does is it makes your opponent have to roll a 6 in order to harm you. If you are naturally born for 20 credits more, you will get an increase to your willpower and intelligence, but you will suffer a minus 1 to your cool. But being at 5 cool is still very good. Iron Flesh sticks out to me in this category as it gives you an additional wound. Prime Specimen also sticks out as it gives you a plus 1 to any single characteristic. Tyrant's Own for your leader is plus one to any two characteristics, which is very good. And there's also some protective items against injury rolls in this category as well. Unborn is 10 credits, and this one is great as it allows you to choose an additional skill. So you could take Nerves of Steel and then pick up something else that could make your leader or champion that much more deadly. Malformed is plus one strength and plus one to your initiative. Two Lives gives you an extra skill again, and Scar Tissue is minus one damage to all incoming hits. Now again, I know there's ways to min-max all of these, and some people like to stack toughness and things like that. Uh, you can certainly find a lot of combinations to make your Goliath characters very strong, all subject to arbitration, of course. I do like to do one Dermal Hardening in a lot of cases for that extra toughness. And then for the next campaign, I may try Tyrant's Own to get that little bit of extra movement, or I may go Naturally Born and look at skills. All right, moving on to topic five, which is our tactics cards. And there are a lot of tactics cards that are really good for House Goliath. We'll only be talking about the gang-specific cards, so your gang generic cards do not apply here. Brutal Charge increases your movement by two and gives you extra attacks, which I think is really good. Inhuman Resilience is a money card, as it allows all of your pinned fighters to stand up, and if you have any seriously injured fighters, you get to take a recovery roll right then and treat a out of action as a serious injury. To me, that card is pretty much an auto-include. Ironhide is very good at negating damage and avoiding pinning. Knockout Blow is an auto-wound card. Second Wind removes flesh wounds. Steel Constitution is very good against gas and toxin weapons. Unstoppable Behemoth, I feel, is another auto-include, as not only does it avoid pinning, it avoids an injury roll altogether. Stem Overload makes your charge actions a basic versus a double, which can be very good. Genetically Gifted is good, as it can give you additional gene smithing, but only for that battle. Go Get Em can give you additional movement, an additional two inches, which is crucial at times, but only during a group activation. Improvised Projectile gives a weapon a 4-inch versatile range, which as we covered, versatile can be very good extending charge ranges. Named and Shamed can help you get additional bodies on the board. One Last Go is situational, but can really throw your opponents for a loop. Tempered in Battle is again situational, as you do have to take an opponent out with a coup de grace move. But if you do, you gain the Fearsome rule, which as we've seen with the Corpse Grinders, if they want to shoot or make a fight action against you, then they have to pass a willpower test. Lastly, we'll look at their only bullets, and that gives that crucial Nerves of Steel skill to all fighters within six inches of your leader or champion and line of sight. They get that skill, that's really good. And overall, House Goliath has a lot of handy tactics cards, some that are certainly I consider auto-include, and others that I highly encourage you to consider. All right, in our last topic, we're gonna talk about the gear and uh, armored undersuits as you move further in the campaign, that increases your save by one. That would pair nicely with your furnace plates as in the front, you would go to a four up save and a five up save overall. I do like stem slug stashes as they increase your overall movement by two inches when you use them. They also increase your strength and toughness by two as well until the end of the turn. The downside is in the end phase, if you roll a one, it does overload and it can cause a flesh wound to you. You do have to repurchase these, but overall, I think they're worth it as House Goliath lacks movement, and this certainly helps make up for that. In addition, if you decide to get any unwieldy weapons that are ranged, such as a heavy bolter, you could consider a suspenser. And, and these things are very expensive to start with, but the suspenser allows you to essentially fire that unwieldy weapon as a single action. 
For trading post items and other combinations, unfortunately we do not dabble in the trading post a lot. That is something that I hope to improve with in our campaigns moving forward, but I just don't have a lot of experience with the trading post at this time and kind of seeing what they can go in there and get that makes them extremely effective. Once I have done that, I may come out with a What I Have Learned Part 2 for House Goliath and we'll report those findings as well. So this pretty much sums up what I've learned so far for House Goliath, and this is certainly ever growing. Again, I'm not an expert in any particular house. I do play a lot. I know several people look at my videos and they think that I must be a subject matter expert, and I have to tell you that I'm not. I'm just your average gamer that plays the games, and these are some things that I've just picked up on over the last few years that maybe will help you out as well. Over time, we do plan to continue to work through all of the gangs and report our learnings. And if we haven't played a gang yet, such as Slave Ogren, I can't report on those because I haven't learned anything about them yet. We have to get in there and make some mistakes and have the community, of course, help point those out in our videos on what we can do to make them better. Your feedback is obviously important to me, and you can certainly connect with me down in the comments below. You know that I read everything and respond to those. And I would like to say thank you to the 2022 Coffee Supporters Club. Uh, your names are on the screen now and certainly appreciate anything that you guys do. If you've watched the video this far, you've done more than enough to support our channel. There's nothing that is necessary uh, for my channel for support or anything like that. We do these just out of love for the hobby. Certainly thank you so much for watching and we will see you in the next one. Take care.